Of course, it works better if I'm unmuted. Greetings, junior scientists, scientists, and citizens of the great, big, weird, wild, wonderful world in which we live. As always, I'm your humble science communicator, the great Orbax, broadcasting here live from Physics Hollywood at the University of Guelph in the barren remains of the McNaughton Building uh, as we sit here at a vacant Saturday night. And I'd like to thank you to all of our viewers who are watching live on the various streams, and especially a huge thank you to all of you joining us from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Montreal Center pages. This is a, a, a lovely opportunity for us to get a chance to actually join up with our friends and collaborate on an incredible project. And what more incredible project can we have than tonight's topic? But first, I would like to start with a very special presentation, and I'd like to pull up my notes here to introduce our, our guests. Um, our first guest tonight is uh, David Levy. Now, David's a world-famous comet hunter and an honorary president of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. David Levy is best known for his 23 comet discoveries, including the famous Shoemaker-Levy 9 comet that collided with Jupiter in 1994, 34 books, and many articles on astronomy. David received his PhD in literature in 2010 and begins the online RASC Montreal Center Clubhouse's public events, Astronomical League Live, and Global Star Parties with literary, with, literary readings, with literary readings as part of his weekly outreach activities. We're so thrilled to have him here tonight to join us. Uh, without further ado, I give you David Levy. Well, thank you all very, very much. I'm going to move the camera a little bit so that you can see me a little bit more. I, I'm going to offer two quotations tonight to sort of hopefully set the mood so that we can talk about Roberta Bondar. And uh, the first is from Horace, who wrote these words in the first century BCE. With my head exalted, I shall touch the stars. And my second one comes from William Blake, from his 1803 poem, Auguries of Innocence. To see the world in a grain of sand, and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. Thank you, and enjoy the meeting tonight. Well, thank you very much for that, David. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on for tonight. And so, well... Welcome in, everyone. Um, it's a lovely Saturday night here, encrusted deep under many layers of negative degrees Celsius and snow as well. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the great Orbax, and we're coming to you live from the University of Guelph, Department of Physics. Now, for those of you who are joining us as friends of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and might not know about Guelph Physics, uh, we do live streams uh, on a pretty regular basis where we interview scientists, physicists, and people who have just a keen interest in any type of uh, science or physics-based phenomena um, on a monthly basis. We also do a ton of outreach activities. You can follow us over on any of the social media streams on our Instagram, Guelph Physics, on YouTube, Guelph Physics, or on Facebook, Guelph Physics. But we're not here tonight to talk about Guelph Physics in many ways. We're here tonight to discuss somebody that's very important and on a, an auspicious occasion, really, when it comes down to it. Um, I've prepared an opening monologue, so please bear with me as I read it for us tonight. The drive to work together to explore the unknown is perhaps epitomizing humanity's exploration of outer space. Working together across the boundaries of countries, aside from the ego of individualism, as one people, we've achieved the impossible and continue to do so on a daily basis. But the inspiration to continue this mission as a species can come down to individual people. And together we gather on the 30th anniversary of one such person's achievement. University of Guelph alumna and the first Canadian woman in space, Dr. Roberta Bondar, boarded the NASA Space Shuttle Discovery on January 22, 1992 and launched to the greater regions of the unknown. But that was not the end of her mission. In the 30 years since, she has become an advocate of conservation, a photographer, and a scientist and continues to inspire generations with her career. Today, we're joined by our friends of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Montreal Centre to look at what she has achieved and how her work continues to inspire scientists across the world. Now... You're right in thinking that was an incredible piece that I've just written just half an hour ago uh, and have given to you now this evening. But I also want to introduce you, as I mentioned, uh, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is co-hosting this with us. And so I'd like to introduce you to another uh, auspicious graduate of the University of Guelph. Um, 
This gentleman is the RASC Montreal Center Public Events Coordinator and Professor at John Abbott College. He's an Explore Alliance Ambassador as well as a panelist on Reach Out and Touch Space on Astro Radio. Without any further ado, I give you Kareem Jeffar. Thanks so much, Orbax, and it's great to be here tonight. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share a screen because what we're here for tonight sure. is this fantastic event to commemorate Dr. Roberta Bondar's first mission in space, her mission in space aboard Discovery. And I have to thank Guelph for the fact that on my very first day as a student at University of Guelph, I got to meet Dr. Bondar. And then this past summer during one of the alumni events, my daughter and I both got to ask her several questions during a Zoom session. And it's just amazing to get this chance to really interact with such a wonderful astronaut and really uh, uh, immense motivation, motivating, inspirational person that we have here in Canada available to us. And some of the work that she's been doing in her foundation is great. And so for tonight's event, I'm really happy that we're going to have two of our former RASC Montreal Centre executive and John Abbott College alumni presenting some really interesting work. Both uh, Virginia is going to be talking a little bit about Dr. Bondar's whole journey and some of the work that she's been doing. And Catherine is going to be talking about a CSA project she got to be part of on feeding future astronauts. But at the RASC Montreal Centre, we try to start off each event with a land and sky acknowledgement. Now, with the land acknowledgement, as a lot of us have been doing over the last few years, we want to acknowledge the fact that our lands are unceded Indigenous lands that were taken care of by the Indigenous peoples of Canada. But from the astronomy side, we also share this, this identification that the sky is shared with not just the Indigenous peoples, but with peoples all over the world and the ancients. And so one of the ways we do so is with like examining the, the lunar moon. And we just passed the full wolf moon, which is the way it's known to the European settlers. And uh, my friend Roger at Astro Radio did this beautiful mineral earth or mineral moon picture for uh, the gibbous moon just the other morning. But the wolf moon is the way we saw it as settlers because we would hear the wolves crying because of their hunger in the wintertime the different indigenous peoples would call the moon based on the way it connected to nature around them. So the Mi'kmaq call it the Tomcod spawning moon because the Tomcod spawning under the frozen rivers was one of the ways in which they knew that the winter was now reaching its culmination and we would soon start to go into hopefully some warmer days down the road. But one of the ones that really sticks out to me is from the Ojibwe and that's uh, Gichi Manidu Giziz. And this was one that was referred to in the Song of Hiawatha with Longfellow. And it goes along with the calling of the December moon as the chief moon by the Mi'kmaq because it's so high in the sky. Because during the summertime, we have the sun up at a very high altitude up for the majority of the daytime. And so our moon tends to be a little bit lower to the horizon, but in the wintertime, the opposite happens. And so the moon is up for most of the night and a long night, and it really shines down on us from a very high altitude. And so they call it the chief or the great spirit moon, depending on the months around the wintertime. I do invite you to visit our website and to get an idea of what we do at the RASC Montreal Centre. We have a lot of different member services as well as outreach and public events. And our monthly public events, this is actually the second straight January we've been able to co-host one with Guelph Physics, which has been a lot of fun for me, especially as a Guelph alumni. We also have our clubhouses that are twice weekly, Wednesdays and Saturdays. And tonight after this YouTube event, we're going to be going directly into our Zoom clubhouse. So you're welcome to join us. If you go to our website and you go to the calendar, you'll see the eight o'clock clubhouse link and you can come and join us and continue chatting about this event or find out a little bit more about the RASC Montreal Center. And of course, I invite you to join us at our next public event, which is going to be next month, February 19th and we're going to be celebrating Perseverance first year on Mars with one of the actual Perseverance scientists, Erin Gibbons, who's a doctoral candidate here at McGill University. And she's gonna be telling us a little bit about that first year and the research she herself has been doing using SuperCam with lasers to investigate the chemistry of Martian rocks. And there's this beautiful picture of the Martian landscape there processed by one of our RASC Montreal Center members, Pete Williamson. So I do invite you to join us at any of our events at the RAC Montreal Centre to get to know more about us. But for now, let's go on to the main event. So Orbax, it's back to you. I'm just uh, so incredibly pleased at how much 
better the tech is this time than it was last time, Kareem. We're bouncing back and forth. It's like we're, we're already some kind of duo act. So if there's, a, I, I assume there's producers from CBC and CTV out there watching right now. Um, I'm very happy to leave Kareem behind if we have the opportunity to go for <laughs> uh, If there's anybody out there. Or Max is a good solo act. That's true. If anybody hasn't watched his amazing stargazing guides, he just oh, uh, lights up the screen. It's so great to thank see. Thank you very much. And thank you for all the help that you provide for those uh, videos as well. Um, but speaking of outer space and the stars and why we're here tonight, I'd like to introduce our first speaker of the evening. Um, our first speaker uh, tonight is joining us. Um, her name is Virginia Rufino Marquez Pacheco, and she's a John Abbott College alumnus or alumna and a second year undergraduate student at Bishop's University doing a physics honors and mathematics major. In addition to being a past center of the JAC Bandersnatch paper and the RASC Montreal Skyward newsletter, Virginia is currently the senior editor for the Natural Science and Mathematics for Bishop's Undergraduate Research Journal and a co-lead for the Astronomy, Mathematics, and Physics Society. She's also serving as the chair of the National Inclusivity and Diversity Committee at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Please give a warm RASC and Guelph Physics uh, welcome to Virginia. Hello. Thank you Hello. for introducing me. So um, I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Let's do it. Hopefully you can all see the slideshow now. All right, so hello everyone. Uh, as was said, my name is Virginia and today I'm going to be talking about Dr. Roberta Bondar, who is an astronaut, a photographer, a scientist, a philanthropist, uh, truly a really inspirational person. So let's begin. So um, as you probably know, uh, Dr. Bondar is in, an internationally recognized person. She is probably one of the most uh, famous Canadians. She is a companion of the Order of Canada. She has received the Order of Ontario. She is a chancellor of Trent. Uh, she was chancellor of Trent University for several years. And as you can see from this extensive list, she has quite a few accomplishments. So what I want to do tonight is kind of take a look at um, her. Um, journey, her um, work essentially, uh, that made her so famous and uh, so popular. So um, let's start with her education. As Orbax mentioned in the introduction, Dr. Bondar is actually uh, an alumna from uh, Guelph University. So she did her bachelor's of science in agriculture, uh, specifically zoology and agriculture at Guelph University. And during her undergraduate uh, degree, she worked for six years for the Federal Fisheries and Forestry Department, uh, which I believe has changed names. Um, and she, her work was specifically on uh, genetics of spruce budworms with reference to the visual system. So she has a, a, a background already in biology at this point. And she went on uh, to pursue uh, a Master of Sciences in Ex Experimental Pathology at Western University. And then she got her PhD and MD uh, in uh, her PhD in Neurobiology at U of T and her MD at McMaster's University. Uh, so she is actually a neurologist uh, by trade and she does have uh, medical licenses to practice in several locations, uh, both in the US and in Canada. Um, and also uh, uh, to note, she was a honor student in professional nature photography at Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, California, which uh, as you'll see, will become quite important uh, later on. So um, she is obviously a very uh, qualified uh, individual in terms of her educational background. And that led her to be able to apply to become one of the first six members of the Canadian Astronaut Corps. Uh, she was selected in 1983 and began, began training in 1984. Uh, you can see on the screen a group picture of that first cohort of Canadian uh, Astronaut Corps, and you can see her at the bottom right. Um, and then she spent essentially almost a decade training, going through uh, the standard uh, astronaut training program um, learning a whole bunch of skills, preparing for the moment in 1992 when she is designated the payload specialist for the first international microgravity laboratory mission 
IML1. Uh, for those of you who do not know, the uh, IML1 is essentially the precursor to the current ISS space station. Um, at this point uh, in time, she has effectively become the first Canadian female astronaut, um, and which is already a huge accomplishment. Um, but it doesn't stop there, as you will see. So as an astronaut, she launched uh, on the Space Shuttle Discovery Mission STS-42 on January 22nd, 1992, and she spent a total of eight days in orbit uh, around the Earth. So as I mentioned before, she became the first Canadian woman in space, and she also became the first neurologist in space. Um, in fact, her background as a neurologist and her, um, her um, work as a neurologist actually helped her uh, do a bunch of work on the station itself. Uh, here's the official portrait of her in astronaut gear. Um, so while she was on IML-1, she conducted over 40 advanced experiments for 14 different na uh, nations. Uh, these experiments centered uh, a lot around the um, the impact of uh, my uh, low gravity on astronauts. So they were very health related, which made her super qualified as a neurologist, as a person with a biological and health sciences background to conduct these these experiments. Um, and as I mentioned before, the International Microgravity Laboratory was the precursor to the ISS. So here she's pictured. Uh, conducting experiments on IML-1. Um, so then she she lands back on Earth eight days later, and you know she's just conducted all these experiments. So obviously it's time to get to work, and she did work very well indeed. She headed an international uh, space medicine research team, so they were looking at all the data they col uh, they collected. Uh, from those experiments, and their goal was to find new connections between astronauts recovering from microgravity of space and neurological Ill illnesses such as stroke and Parkinson's disease. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they were trying to uh, well, they were trying to make connections between uh, both uh, phenomena, essentially. And so, she did a lot of work in this uh, in the like uh, couple of years following. Uh, her flight to space. So by this point, she is already um, really, really famous. Uh, everyone in Canada at the time probably knew her name, knew who she was, um, because she had just like had taken such a huge leap already uh, by becoming an astronaut. Um, so later, she uh, decided to turn to one of her earlier pass passions, uh, even before uh, she became an astronaut and went up in space, she had already um, uh, done photography. It was something that she loved doing. Um, and so, um, and in 1997, uh, her pictures were actually exhibited uh, in the exhibition titled Beauty of Another Order, Photography in Science at the National Gallery of Canada. Um, so she is actually a very good photographer. In fact, I will show you a, a sample of her images uh, soon. And currently her works are exhibited everywhere uh, by the Locke Gallery in Toronto, Calgary and Winnipeg, the Art Gallery of Algoma in Salt St. Mary, where she, uh, Salt St. Mary is her hometown, and Hooper's Gallery in London, UK, as well as many other public and private collections, uh, both in the US and in Canada. So she is a very accomplished photographer. Um, and this is a quote from her that was taken actually a few days ago um, from an interview with CDV News. And she said, it was the reality of the moment of actually seeing it as a planet and seeing, well, not seeing actually any life, any life below, but seeing all of these beautiful colors and geography that we learned in school. And it just really made me want to pay a bit more attention to what was on the surface of the planet. So as you can see, um, for her, her experience going into space had a very huge impact on, on what she decided to do once she came back to Earth. So um, hopefully, if this works well, I'm going to 
uh, show you. Oops. Yes, so this is on her website. Um, and you can see a sample of several of her pictures uh, that she took. Um, she is a nature photographer. So she focuses a lot on capturing the natural world, capturing the beauty of the natural world. Um, so here's a sample. She's traveled um, all over the world. She's uh, been to every single national park in Canada and photographed them. So it's really a passion for her uh, to photograph the beauty of the natural world, to highlight that. And she does it with a purpose as well, um, as I will explain very soon. So the, these are a sample. You can see more of them on her website. She has several. So let me go back to sh sharing. Am I presentation mode? I think so. Oh, oh no, sorry. All right, we're back. So, um, yes, here is uh, a, a quote from uh, her um, found, she, she has a foundation um, and this is from the website. So uh, it says currently she's photographing migratory birds and their habitats, both aerial and surface perspectives. And her goal with uh, this project currently is to highlight essentially the impact that loss of habitat and climate change in general is having on uh, birds and migratory birds. Uh, she has authored several books uh, in which feature um, more of her photography. So the arid edge of earth, landscape of dreams, passionate vision, touching the earth. Um, and she has also chaired the working group on environmental education for the province of Ontario in 2007. And uh, um, all of the recommendations actually from that working group were implemented by the government of Ontario. So um, you can already see a trend in um, her motivations uh, behind what she is doing. Um, she's also a philanthropist. So um, after having been to space and essentially seeing uh, the earth from such a unique perspective, and also, she mentioned several times, if you look at interviews with her, uh, something that struck her a lot was the lack of uh, natural sounds, like birds singing or just, you know, the wind blowing through trees. So all of that, um, through that really intense experience of going to space, really uh, made her essentially realize how important uh, the natural world was for her. And so in July 2009, she, found, she established the Roberta Bondor Foundation, which is a not-for-profit charity. Um, and essentially, uh, as you can see on the quote, the more we learn about the, our environment and the better we become asking important questions, the better equipped we will be both to respond to change and to influence positive change. Addressing the growing nature deficit in society the Roberta Bonder Foundation helps cultivate in all ages a sense of awe, respect, and appreciation for other life forms that share our planet. So once again, you can see the very strong environmental um, activism, almost I would say, in, in um, this foundation and in her pho photographic work. So um, essentially, um, the, her foundation and uh, is in herself to um, use um, photography as the main medium to bring awareness to um, environmental issues, but they also frame it in a very positive light. So uh, the message that, that she and the foundation try to push is how um, the environment's beauty, like taking a moment to appreciate the beauty that exists in the natural world um, leads to hope. First of all, because sometimes that is something that uh, can be lacking when you see all the issues. And also embracing the environmental heritage increases ethical behavior. So essentially what she is trying to do is through the use of photography, uh, she is trying to um, make people like take a step back and realize how um, important and beautiful the environment is 
to um, everyone, to everyone's well-being. And she is aiming that through that realization, it'll encourage people to take more action, more concrete action, think about more ethical environmental behavior, etc. And infusing art with science and science with art stimulates learning and curiosity in people of all ages, including intergenerational dialogue. Um, so this is another thing that Dr. Bondar is really um, emphatic on, is, use, is um, using arts with sciences and sciences with the arts. Um, not long ago, I saw a clip of her saying how she, um, you know, at some point the arts and the sciences seem to have split along, uh, you know, our history and how she thinks that it's not necessarily a good thing um, because, um, for example, you know, if you're trying to do some art, you need some, you know, scientific knowledge to base your art in. Like if you're trying to draw a person, you need to know a little bit about, you know, human anatomy. And the reverse is true. Um, when you're doing science, you need that element of creativity, which art can give you. And so she's really um, emphatic on using, on mixing arts and sciences um, in order to learn because she thinks uh, learning is really important. That's one of the things she advocates a lot. As a, a philanthropist, she will often uh, give presentations at different schools, uh, talk to different people, all with the goal of encouraging learning. And I think this quote is a very nice one to end with. If we don't ask those deep questions about what's out there, then we are never going to evolve. And I think that really summarizes, I think, uh, not only her experience, but her views, uh, because, you know, she is someone that has, without a doubt, broken barriers by becoming the first Canadian woman in space, she, uh, by becoming the first neurologist in space. And um, what really pushed her all this time uh, is her curiosity, her desire to ask why, to keep learning, uh, to use different mediums to keep learning. Uh, you, she has a background in biology and health sciences. Uh, she's done scientific studies, but she's also a photographer. You, she still incorporates um, those elements of creativity to explore other questions. And in fact, having pushed herself to probably um, one of the farthest limits that he, um, humans have gone uh, to this day, um, she, it made her really um, appreciate even more the planet she left behind when she took off. And, I, and combining all of that together, you really get this sense that Dr. Bondar is really um, a curious person that is open to using so many different uh, mediums to further what she believes is very important. And for her, um, that is also uh, encouraging learning on um, young people and children, and even people of all ages, and also encouraging a greater appreciation of the natural world that surrounds us. And so I think that um, Dr. Bontar is a truly inspirational individual. Um, we should all be proud that she's Canadian um, and that she has done so many things and continues to do so many things to this day. She's still out there, uh, she's still going. And um, I think uh, that she has had definitely a really huge impact on uh, our society here in this country. So I, that ends my presentation on Dr. Bondar. I hope you uh, appreciated it. Let me stop sharing the screen. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, and I hope that one day you get the chance to see her talk or meet her in person. Uh, maybe if you go to Guelph, she might come back. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, let's bring Kareem in here as well. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, you, you know, so I wanted to point out again, uh, just as Virginia mentioned, we, we are able to ask questions live here. So if you have questions for Virginia, 
um, please just put them into the comment section. They come in. We have the opportunity to share them. We'll ask them for. Um, but I, I was just going to to share some of my memories based on the topic to start out with. I mean, in 1992, I was just starting out in high school. Uh, Kareem, you had probably already graduated university at that point um because you're much much older than i am first but, day uh, on campus first day on campus <laughs> but uh it, it was an interesting thing because you know uh, a, a, a female astronaut at the time was a rarity enough uh let alone a canadian astronaut uh so she was literally in the newspapers on tv all the time and you couldn't really go anywhere without seeing something about her i'm curious virginia from your perspective as a, a younger person uh what was what is she what was she like was she kind of a figure that was sort of already in the ether was it somebody that was still talked about in younger generations well i can't speak for everyone but for in my own experience um i did not actually know about dr bondar until i went to professor jaffer's classroom which i think is pretty telling about mm -hmm. um how we perceive different astronauts because she has undoubtedly done um or and has had such a huge impact like you said back when the launch happened 1992 she was everywhere in the news everyone knew who she was and yet it's she people stopped kind of talking about her um to uh, and a lot of us uh, in my generation i think didn't know who she was which i think is pretty t um that was kind of my yeah, that's kind of been my my experience as well and and i, I was going to ask you do you think that that's a thing um that we see about astronauts in general, or is that a Canadian thing? Um, I'm not too sure because, well, for example, I think a lot of people know uh, who Chris Hatfield is. Uh, sure, you know, yeah, that makes every, sense. Yep. Everyone, like, I mean, he he came after Dr. Bondar, but still everyone knows who he is, or certainly a lot more people know who he is than they know who Dr. Bondar is. Um, and I think uh, even, I don't even think it's like a Canadian versus an American astronaut thing because, you know, everyone knows Neil Armstrong, everyone knows Chris Hadfield, mm. but um, nobody really talks about, for example, Sally Ride or Dr. Bondar. And it's, oh, yeah, and point. there's this trend of the female astronauts being forgotten, even though they're trailblazers. And Absolutely. anytime they become an astronaut, they are a trailblazer. And it's also, I mean, Dr. Bondar herself said in an interview just earlier this week that for 30 years nobody's come and talked to her nobody really comes and asks her her opinion on space or on you well, know that's a, that's a, on the iss or any of that, that that's an incredibly valid point right because you know i think societally we have this sort of thing where we just say okay great achievement now on to the next thing rather than looking at these people as incredible resources that we can constantly learn from moving forward i was really happy to read about the work that she did with the environmental curriculum in ontario and that they did go to her foundation and her herself for that expertise, because that's something that you don't really hear too much about. It wasn't advertised or anything, but knowing that they went to somebody with some actual pedagogical experience, but also coming at it from different perspectives. And Virginia, I was actually wondering, because with Dr. Bondar, she combines photography with her love of space and of neurology and of the way in which the human body works you've really kind of dove into journalism and science communication. And so do you see parallels there or do you feel like there's there's overlap or do you feel like there's something in that complementary approach where you can combine a little bit of the artistic side with a little bit of the communication and visualization side? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I definitely think that um, in order to, because I mean, you can go into science doing, you know, purely the field that you are working in, which is, well, it works for a lot of people, but I find that um, mixing it in with different fields that you can kind of relate to can really helps you develop creativity and helps you see things from different perspectives, which is also super important in sciences. So I definitely think that exploring different fields, whether it be in the arts or uh, journalism or even the social sciences can definitely help you uh, gain a different perspective to solve problems. Yeah, it's absolutely that thinking outside of the box kind of mentality where it's just like you said, solving problems from different perspectives. Now, I don't want to uh, take up too much time, but we do have a question on the stream uh, specifically for you, Virginia. This one comes in from Harold Locke. 
uh, who wants to know how Dr. Bondar has influenced your personal path. Well, I think that um, Dr. Bondar has definitely, um, well, and especially learning about her over, uh, over the years since Professor Jaffer's class, um, has kind of encouraged me in a way to pursue uh, different areas. Like I'm currently studying physics, but I also have interest in other areas. And I think that there is this, um, not, I, I, like, I don't know how accurate this is, but this kind of impression that um, some people may have that science is like the better uh, area to learn or do work in. But it's really encouraged me to kind of branch out because like there are advantages to be gained from just learning other things uh, that don't necessarily entirely overlap with whatever your main interest is. So in that sense, she, um, I think that she has definitely um, helped me gain confidence um, and in myself and just what I enjoy learning. It's also important to note uh, CDB45 actually pointed out that social media came after the 90s when Dr. Bondar and others went up to space, really kind of setting the way. Neil Armstrong, we know that name because of the momentous moment when he stepped foot on the moon. Buzz Aldrin because he was part of that initial mission. But a lot of the other Apollo astronauts aren't really common, commonly known. And these days, I mean, with Chris Hadfield, with the music as well as with the videos that he did and the, even the classroom visits while he was up in the ISS and setting up those video streams, even with David St. Jacques now, there's a difference now because the media is a little bit more pervasive. Um, do you find that you know more about what the CSA is doing and what astronauts are doing now than when you were in elementary and high school? Definitely. Um, I think uh, that the space industry in general has done a much better job, uh, increasingly better job at outreaching to the general public because, um, you know, if the general public doesn't really know what you're doing or has really no interest in what you're doing, then it doesn't help anyone to develop the space industry to uh, ex keep exploring what's out there if you don't garner uh, the public interest. And so I think it's a really good thing that space agencies have been increasingly um, using tools like social media to reach out to the general public um, to kind of promote all the cool things that are being done and to um, foster interest among the youth, especially uh, for these fields. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, Virginia's going to stick around with us for the rest of the uh, stream, and we'll bring you on later on for a full open house chat here. Um, but thank you very much for that presentation. Thank I'd like you. to move towards our next presenter. So without any further ado still, uh, our next presenter uh, is Catherine Dulong. Catherine's a John Abbott College and McGill University alumni and or alumna and our former RASC Montreal Centre president. Catherine's a registered dietitian based in Montreal, Quebec, who recently entered at the Canadian Space Agency. She worked on the Deep Space Food Challenge, a competition aimed at creating food production technologies for space travel. Let's give her a warm RASC and Guelph Physics stream. Welcome. Hi. Hey, there she is. <laughs> Hi, there Catherine, how are you? Doing good, slight technical issue there, but we are on. So Fantastic. good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Catherine, and like Orbach said, great introduction. Um, I worked at the Canadian Space Agency last summer under Space Exploration Strategic Planning, which is the same division that's responsible for the Lunar Gateway Project, but I worked specifically in food production. So today I'll be sharing a little bit about how to feed astronauts because it's not rocket science. And let me go ahead and share my screen. So let's get that started. Doo -doo. Okay, screen. And there we go. I hope that's working. So yeah, feeding astronauts. It's not rocket science. Um, so let me begin by telling you a little bit about me. So like I said, I'm Catherine. Um, I'm currently based in Hochelaga, an up and coming neighborhood in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, I attended John Abbott College from 2016 to 2018, where I had Karim as a professor for one of my physics classes. And then I graduated and attended McGill University McDonald campus from 2018 to 2021. Ironically, McGill McDonald campus happens to be across the street from John Abbott College. So I was actually right next door, just doing different things. 
Um, I studied health science at John Abbott and um, actually chose to pursue human genetics rather than astronomy or astrophysics as my one science elective. And at McGill, I was part of the School of Human Nutrition and I completed my bachelor's in dietetics about a month ago. So I technically still don't have my degree yet, which is infuriating, but here we are. Um, I currently work as a registered dietitian at the Douglas Mental Health University Institute, where I work with an inpatient clientele of teenagers with eating disorders. Um, so as for my interest in astronomy, it arose while I was at John Abbott College, um, thanks to Karim and my best friend Emily. And I really committed to astronomy when I started at McGill and joined the RASC Montreal Center. Um, and I started as a newsletter editor, became president, and finally past president. And now I'm simply a member, and I'm also a member of another astronomy society in my neighborhood that's more francophone and affiliated with the Montreal Planetarium. It's called CEPM, and it is wonderful. So that's enough information for me for the time being. So here is the agenda for this presentation. So uh, we'll begin by reviewing some general characteristics of food in space, so general constraints that it's subject to. Uh, then we'll look on how to feed astronauts on the ISS. Then how to feed astronauts on the journey to Mars, since that is undoubtedly our next destination. Um, and finally, we'll assess how to feed astronauts on Mars. So once we get to Mars, because we'll hypothetically find our way there within the next few years. And um, I've reserved some time at the end of the presentation to an answer any questions you may have. So similar to uh, what we just did with Virginia. Um, I would say to ask questions throughout the presentation, but that will be technically challenging. So keep your questions for the end or drop them in the uh, chat section. So let's start by talking about some general characteristics of food in space. So space is obviously a different environment than Earth. So it comes with different constraints for food. So first of all, it's incredibly important for astronauts to meet their nutrient needs in space. So it's important to meet our nutrient needs on Earth as well to maintain adequate nutritional status, maintain muscle mass and bone density. But this is even more important in space. Astronauts on the ISS are subject to cosmic radiation, microgravity, both of which have detrimental effects on the human body. Space is not kind to us. We're, we're not meant to be there. And we all know astronauts uh, need to exercise a lot while on the ISS to prevent loss of muscle mass and bone density. But eating properly is equally important to ensure astronauts stay as healthy as possible because you need to eat to provide the building blocks for muscle and bone. Um, so NASA is actually in fact of um, developing the nutritional requirements of astronauts using scientific literature. Um, at the moment, these requirements are a tiny bit outdated, so that's not the best. Um, I won't be going into that today since that would take up a lot of time. But um, yeah, so food and space is also really important from the community aspect. So astronauts are really busy and taking the time to gather for a meal is important from a team building perspective. It's always nice to share a meal with others and it helps them get closer and really work as a team. Um, food can also be essential for combating homesickness since astronauts are away from their home, family, friends for long periods of time. And finally, there are multiple constraints associated with spaceflight and having food in space. So the food uh, needs to be compact and lightweight as volume and mass are limited when we go to space. It needs to be nutritious and tasty as previously discussed. Um, so get nutritious to meet the nutritional requirements of astronauts and keep them healthy. And it also has to be tasty because otherwise they won't eat it and then we're nowhere. Um, and yes, so it also needs to be sticky or wet to avoid getting crumbs in the equipment. I'm pretty sure all of us know at least a little bit about that. And it needs to be processed or pasteurized for food safety because if an astronaut gets food poisoning on the ISS, that is not a good time. So we really want to avoid that. So let's talk a little bit about food on the ISS. So astronauts are currently only stationed on the ISS and food on the ISS is governed by a different set of constraints than food needed on the journey to Mars or on Mars, as we'll see later. So there's no fridge or freezer on the ISS, which is actually quite interesting. So there's no cold storage facility for food. There's also no stove, but there is a convection oven. Unfortunately, it doesn't heat as hot as a conventional household oven on Earth, uh, but it does heat reasonably well. So it is a, an option for preparing food. Uh, there's also a water dispenser that can be used to rehydrate food with hot or cold water. So that's pretty useful. The hot water is actually fairly hot, so that does help to rehydrate uh, the food. 
And astronauts on the ISS eat six types of food, which are in fact very similar to foods that we eat on Earth. So there's fresh food, and that's food such as fruits and vegetables, which need to be eaten within days of being delivered from Earth. So the ISS gets food deliveries from Earth relatively frequently, and that's how they get uh, restocked with foods. They never have to have an insane amount of food on the ISS because they can get it from Earth. It's not that far. Um, the natural foods include foods like tortillas as well and um, nuts, which can be eaten just as is. Um, so those are the uh, natural form foods. Uh, there's also dried foods, which include uh, dried fruit like dates and apricots. Those are also very popular. Irradiated food is uh, includes meat, and um, some foods on Earth are also irradiated. It's a preservation method. Um, foods on Earth that are irradiated are dried herbs and spices, potatoes, onions, and ground beef. On the ISS, it's likely to be more meat or animal products. Um, there's dehydrated food. That's typically what you think of as astronaut food. So those are the packets of food. Um, that you see astronauts eat. And finally, thermal stabilized food is the equivalent of pasteurized food in that it's stabilized via application of heat and pressure. So all of these foods are foods that astronauts can eat on the ISS. So let's look into some more key aspects of food on the ISS. So it's actually very similar to food on Earth, surprisingly, but it's prepared in different ways. Since there's no stove, there's only a convection oven and a hot or cold water dispenser. And food is delivered from Earth every three months or so, every 90 days. So astronauts have access to fresh fruits and vegetables once in a blue moon. Um, tortillas are especially popular as an item on the ISS since they have a longer shelf life than bread, but provide the same kind of comforting aspect. And uh, food scientists package the dehydrated food before it gets shipped to the ISS. Um, so they're responsible for the food safety testing as well to, again, make sure astronauts don't get food poisoning or food intoxication. Um, and scissors are actually the most essential kitchen tool on the ISS because you need scissors to open the sealed packages of dehydrated food so you can put the water in them to rehydrate, rehydrate them. And uh, yeah, so most of us are fairly familiar with the types of food astronauts eat on the ISS, but food on the journey to Mars and on Mars are subject to different constraints, as we'll see now. So let's consider uh, food on the journey to Mars. So the travel time from Earth to Mars is around seven months one way, and a trip to Mars would typically be a three-year round trip. So since the travel time from Earth to Mars is significantly greater than the travel time from Earth to the ISS, which makes sense because the distance is significantly greater, this makes deliveries from Earth impossible. So while you can get restocks of food on the ISS, on Mars, you're, or on the way to Mars, you're just a little bit too far. Uh, so this heightens the volume and mass constraints that are present on the ISS. And so packaged food becomes nearly impossible since packaging has volume and mass that provides no nutrition. We want to really maximize the amount of food on the spaceship rather than the packaging, which has no inherent value other than holding the food. So as such, the journey to Mars requires a move away from ready-made foods and more towards food production systems. So these systems should have minimal inputs and maximal outputs and produce safe, nutritious, and delicious food uh, for our astronauts. And circular systems are particularly interesting in this scenario since they allow for uh, recycling of waste to generate more food, which again helps reduce um, the amount of volume and mass that's unnecessary on the ship. So as you see in this picture, this is a food production system um, that would typically be what we'll see on the journey to Mars. And um, you see half a man on the left. Uh, that was actually my manager at the space agency. Um, he was, that's Matt Bamsey. He was one of the final 17 astronaut candidates during the last round of selection in 2016, 2017, uh, the year they chose Joshua Kutrick and Jenny City Gibbons as uh, Canadian astronauts. Little side note. Um, so now that we know that we need food production systems instead of ready-made food for the journey to Mars, what are these food production systems and what food do they produce? So we understand what food is on an intrinsic level. So if I tell you what an orange is, we understand what that is. But food production systems are a conceptual challenge in some ways. Um, the truth is that food production systems can take on many different forms and produce many different foods. It's not a one-size-fits-all kind of deal you can kind of do anything. And so my work at the CSA was mostly centered around the Deep Space Food Challenge, which is a challenge that offers funding to individuals or teams who can design a food production system for space travel that also has terrestrial potential, so equally important. 
So let's talk a little bit more about the Deep Space Food Challenge. So um, while my work at the CSA was really focused on this project, um, I also happened to help with the Junior Astronauts Virtual Day Camp, which was a fantastic experience. Um, I organized some activities with the other interns and uh, wrote an administrative document about intersectionality. So it was a really great experience in terms of learning about a lot of different things. Um, I can share more about what I did at the CSA during the question period, but uh, for now, let's go back to the challenge. So the goal of the Deep Space Food Challenge was to create novel food production technologies or systems that require minimal inputs and maximize safe, nutritious, and palatable food outputs for long duration space, mis space missions and which have potential to benefit people on Earth. So this was really key. This terrestrial potential piece was especially important because we wanted the food production system to have applications not only for space travel, but also to reduce food insecurity on Earth. So if we're able to grow food in space or on the way to Mars or even on Mars, hopefully that also helps produce food for areas that are food insecure, say um, northern parts of Canada, like Nunavik and Nunavut, which are very cold and um, are really difficult to grow food in. Um, yeah, and then the designs have to be innovative, novel, and sustainable. Innovation was key, so we didn't want to see a rehashed version of an existing system. Uh, it had to have scientific and technical merit, but also has to be feasible. Um, acceptability was a fun challenge because both the food production system and its way of being used had to be acceptable, but also the food product. So the food product had to be palatable in that, and going back to the tasty piece where astronauts had to want to eat it. Uh, it had to be safe, both in terms of operational safety, so in terms of using the food production system, and food safety, so the food output had to be safe. And again, minimal inputs, maximal outputs, same as usual. And um, the process and the products had to be reliable and stable, and the food had to be of good nutritional quality, which is where I came in as a registered dietitian who was at that point a nutrition student. Um, so now that we've covered the Deep Space Food Challenge, let's see which systems were promising for producing food on the journey to Mars. So there were 10 semi-finalists that were chosen after the first phase of the challenge. So to give you an idea, during that first phase of the challenge, we had 61 project submissions and um, 26 were out of scope or incomplete or not as promising as the 35 others that were kept. And of those 35, um, 10 were selected as semi-finalists, so as the winners of the first phase of the challenge. So it's a gated challenge in a way. Um, and yeah, so these semi-finalists all pitched food production systems that produce food that fits into one of these four categories. So some teams created uh, insect production systems that produced black soldier flies or crickets. So these are especially promising because animal protein may be hard to come by um, on the way to Mars, and insects are a really sustainable, easy way to obtain this type of protein. So this was a fantastic idea. Um, other teams created microalgae production systems. So uh, they created spirulina or uglina specifically, also a great idea, very nutritionally um, dense. And still others created plant production systems that generated plants like fruits and vegetables. These typically have high acceptance because, I mean, everyone loves strawberries and we're familiar with fruits and vegetables and they're no different in space, or at least not that much. And um, finally, some created mushroom production systems uh, that yielded mycelium meat substitute, and I included yeast in there since it's technically fungi, uh, but I'm kind of reaching there. Um, and the mycelial meat substitute was actually called space bacon and it seemed really promising. While the yeast was actually a project that came out of Concordia University here in Montreal, um, with a team called Astro Yeast, where they aim to use yeast, bioengineered yeast, as a nutritional supplement um, by bioengineering the yeast to produce specific vitamins and minerals. So actually really cool project. So now for food on Mars. So food on Mars is not like in the Martian. It's not like this image where we see uh, Matt Damon growing potatoes. We're far from being able to recreate his potato farm in the iconic movie. But the good news is that the same food production systems that we can use on the journey to Mars could be used on Mars itself to grow food. And since the astronauts would have the journey to really get familiar with the, um, the operational capacities of the food production systems, um, they'd be very familiar with them by the time they get to Mars and could then have some time to attempt growing food on Mars. 
However, the soil there, not optimal for growing crops. It's missing several nutrients plants need to grow. So we would either need to enrich the soil or more likely food crops would have to be grown using aeroponics or hydroponics. But luckily, both aeroponics and hydroponics are frequently used on Earth and it'd be easy to adapt these technologies to Mars. Um, and eventually, we could also progress to using enriched Martian soil to grow crops and maybe even terraform Mars. But for the time being, this is science fiction, like in the Martian. Hello. Yes, so as we reach the end of this presentation and the question session, here are my final thoughts. So food in space is complicated, even more so than food on Earth. There are many constraints governing what food in space can and cannot be. It needs to meet the nutritional requirements of astronauts to keep them as healthy as possible, despite cosmic radiation and microgravity negatively affecting their bodies. Um, it needs to be nutritious to provide the building blocks to maintain muscle mass and bone density. Um, food on the ISS is, again, fairly easy to provide, considering the ISS is close to Earth and its constraints are well known. We've had astronauts on the ISS for ages. Um, and the possibility, the possibility of receiving deliveries from Earth makes food easier in that way, where they can even get access to fresh fruits and vegetables, which is amazing to think about. Um, food on Mars is markedly harder since it's further from Earth and its constraints are less well known. So the journey to Mars comes with unique challenges and uh, hopefully the same food production systems will keep astronauts fed both on the way to Mars and on Mars. And finally, what's awesome is that people are designing innovative solutions right now. So the Deep Space Food Challenge provide a really strong incentive for Canadians and Americans alike to tackle this problem, which is one of the main barriers when it comes to crude space flight to Mars. And uh, yeah, with the challenge now really in phase two, where the teams are actively designing the food production systems, it's happening right now. It's, it's an amazing time to be alive for food production and uh, space travel. So before we go into the question period, I wanted to end with a Deep Space Food Challenge promotional video that nicely uh, summarizes the goals of the challenge and the constraints associated with food and space travel. So it's really short. We'll just watch that. Let's see if it works. And then we will go into the question period. Let's see, does this work? Yes. Making a grilled cheese sandwich is simple. Unless you're on the moon, you're flying in space. Right now, astronauts aboard the space station get food thanks to spacecraft regularly launching from Earth. But future astronauts on a trip to Mars will spend years away from our planet. That means no quick trips to the grocery store or cargo ships bringing supplies. They'll have to bring just about everything they need with them. Is that even feasible? To boldly go where no human has gone before, we have to invent food production systems that can be used in space. These new solutions could also improve our food systems on Earth. They might even help us reduce food insecurity on our planet. That's why NASA and the Canadian Space Agency are launching the Deep Space Food Challenge. Participants can win prize money for their ideas on how to keep our astronauts fed on future space exploration missions. We believe you can make it happen. Go to deepspacefoodchallenge.org and get involved today. Hello, oh, are we are we able to escape the video? Okay. We are. So thank you very much, Catherine, for your yeah. presentation. It's fantastic. Let's bring Kareem back on as well. Yes, hold on. Let me stop sharing. But yeah, I'm ready to take questions now. If yeah, anybody absolutely. Has any so, Catherine, there already are some questions coming yep. into the, the uh, chat feed there. And again, I want to point out, if you do have a question, uh, we're feel free to add them into the chat. We're free to answer these live as they come in. Uh, the first I, want, oh, I want to end with a question. Are we going to see space bacon on the grocery shelves anytime soon? Because we see Beyond Meat is pretty profitable. So this is a good way to make some money. Um, Beyond Meat is a hyper-processed food that is pea protein-based. Very different from the mycelial meat substitute, which is like a mushroom. Um, that team seemed really awesome. They're doing incredible things, uh, but I don't think it's coming right away. Although they're working on it, um, it's it's actively happening, which is amazing. It's a great it's, idea. Oh, it's the best. And it's especially incredible because Canada has really had only two specialties when it comes to space. Like the CSA is good with robotics. Think yeah. of Canadarm, one, two, and three, and satellites. We're incredibly good at satellites. We have MDA that's based out of Montreal, actually in Brampton, um, and they're incredible. But we just Brampton, just... across Highway 40 from John Abbott and McGill. Yeah, it's right there. So honestly, I've taken the bus past it so many times, and they're generating these incredible satellites. Um, but 
as for food production, we also have an incredible amount of potential in Canada, but it hasn't been exploited yet, which is infuriating on my end because that's the one aspect I couldn't be involved in. I have no expertise in robotics or satellites, but I can do food. That's my thing. So yeah, hopefully we'll get there and the food production systems will get developed and then we'll see space bacon on Canadian grocery shelves. Fantastic. Well, our first question from the chat comes in from Maury Portnoff and uh, they're asking why can there not be a fridge on the ISS? I think that just relates back to optimization of mass. And I mean, if you can just bring in food every three months, you can live off the, the dried food packets. And a fridge, it requires a lot of power. It's a highly inefficient appliance in, in terms of electricity. And overall, since the ISS isn't that far from Earth and it's able to get cargo deliveries for food, I think they just decided to go without it and have more room for scientific equipment. And that's it. It also would affect the thermal balance of the air and the heat inside. And that would be an issue for a lot of the electronics. Which is bad. No fridge. We've got another one coming in. And I think this is, I mean, this tends to be a, uh, I think this will be more of a trend that we'll see growing as, as we explore space more. And this one is about lab grown meat being considered for the trip to Mars. More of the challenges associated with that. Of course, we do know that there are 3D printing uh, meat in laboratories these days. Are we looking at something like that being possible? So um, on the Canadian side, no teams involved in cellular agriculture and lab grown meat won the first phase of the Deep Space Food Challenge. But on the American side, there are some teams that are working really hard on lab grown meat for space applications. The problem is the technology is still not that advanced compared to plant production technologies. And so there's kind of a lag at that level. Um, I'm not as familiar with the challenges associated with it as I would like to be, but it's actively happening more on the American side. On the Canadian side, not so much. The applications we got that were focused on cellular agriculture, I think about two or three, were very incomplete and conceptually challenging. So we're not we're not quite there on this side of the border, but on the American side, yes, um, yeah, it's it's definitely a potential way to produce food for space, but it's not as simple as um, just a simple plant production system, which was what a lot of teams uh, went for. Exciting! The, the 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 questions are coming in fast and furious here on the chat. We got another question coming in from Harold Locke. Uh, Harold to the root cellar is maybe an external hull for freezer space. That would be awesome. Um, I don't know if that's would happen, but fantastic idea. My guess is it would get quite cold. That would be the issue. <laughs> Extra cold. Like just a little yeah. bit of freezer burn. Yeah, just, perhaps. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. So I'm wondering, Catherine, how do you feel in ter about the overall nutritional balance of the current way the ISS astronauts are being fed and the way in which we see, you know, th there's a lot of growth now of just simple lettuces, simple plants and tomatoes and stuff on the ISS, do you feel like that's giving enough nutritional balance or is there a skew in one direction or the other from what you've seen? So um, in my humble opinion, growing lettuce in space is garbage. It's a terrible idea. Lettuce has very little nutritional content in terms of vitamins, minerals, calories, macronutrients. It's an inefficient use of resources to grow something that is effectively void. Unless you're talking kale or something like that, something that has more nutritional value, I'm not interested. Like, I want potatoes. Like, I want food that has nutritional value for astronauts, specifically calories. And NASA is the organization that's in charge of determining the nutritional requirements of astronauts. Like I said, those are outdated. They're using uh, caloric and protein requirements that are wrong. That's like actually one of the discussions that some of my students brought up last term when we were talking about the growing of lettuce and the fact that they now have this fresh produce. And they were like, but why would they go with something as 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 empty as that? But it's good for the mental health of astronauts because it's there's the enjoyment piece as well. But as long as palatability is there, we can definitely get more nutritious crops involved. There's a lot of things you can grow that are more nutritionally dense than lettuce and are just as delicious and are even more versatile. Um, there's also the challenge of the convection oven doesn't work super well and the water's not that hot. So anything that needs to be cooked becomes difficult unless it comes with 
an appliance itself within the food production technology that can be used to cook the crop. So I know you didn't want to talk about the Martian itself, but what about starches? How do they deal with starches for deep for deep deep space exploration or at least solar system exploration? Can is there a solution for sweet potatoes, potatoes, rices, things like that, or is that just something that has to go off to the side? That there's actually teams that are designing systems that can produce those foods. They have different like nutrient requirements in the soil. I'm not as familiar with that, but it's a possibility. It's just we're I guess we're used to seeing lettuce going into space, or lettuce and tomatoes. Like tomatoes are a little bit better, but it's really not what I would gun for. It's an option. I guess it's just not as easy from an agricultural perspective, from a plant production perspective, which is not my expertise. My concern is space is not good for our bodies. Astronauts need more protein and calories than the average person on Earth. And the requirements are outdated. We're not, there's not enough nutritional research that's coming out of the ISS or really any laboratory on Earth or anything to give us like actual valid scientific data. We're basing ourselves off nutritional requirements for people on Earth, even though the conditions are wildly different. It's just not working. And the requirements haven't been updated in years. So yeah, lots of issues with that. We're not gonna go into that because I will start ranting. I've also had to explain multiple times that tube feeding astronauts is not a good idea. Um, yeah, it's been fantastic. I think we'll have to have that rant at some point though. Eventually, different presentation. It's like- I'm assuming minutes. it's coming at some point here. Now, we'll, uh, I'd like to open this up to everybody. We'll bring Virginia back as well. And if there's questions for the entire panel, we'd be happy to, uh, to field any of them as they come in. Um, but in general, I mean, while we've got everybody here, uh, Catherine, I, I'd like to ask you, um, we would ask Virginia a similar question. Uh, how has Dr. Bondar's career sort of been an inspiration to you? Um, so I'm about the same age as Virginia, a little bit older. Um, I was very aware of Canadian astronauts who are women within my childhood for different reasons. But anyway, um, Roberta Bondar is no doubt my favorite Canadian astronaut. It used to be Julie Payette, but then she became governor general or something and a bunch of unsavory news came out about her. Um, but yeah, I was obsessed with Julie Payette and Roberta Bondar as a kid. And I don't know, I've just... I've always been really inspired by women in space. Sally Ride is my favorite American astronaut. And I've just always been fascinated by space travel specifically and pushing the limits of the human body in that way. And I don't know, it's it's just, it's always been about pushing the limits. And that's that's exactly what I did where there are no nutrition people who work at the space agency. There were two of us. The other one is was also at McGill. Shout out to Hope, she's fantastic, but it was it was incredible to be the one person within my department who had any level of expertise in nutrition where I would constantly end up having to mention things like, no, it's not a good idea to live off potatoes and butter. That's not nutritionally relevant for astronauts. Or no, it's not a good idea to use parental nutrition to feed astronauts. Or no, you can't do this when it comes to, no. So it was, um, it's definitely been interesting and yeah roberta bondar has always been a really big inspiration for me or any any canadian astronaut for that matter so, so you're telling me that the freeze-dried ice cream that i was always told was what astronauts lived on exclusively that and uh powdered orange juice that somehow that doesn't reach the nutritional requirements of grown adults when they're off planet unfortunately not i wish it That's did shocking no. to me. now i do i do have a question uh i was i was curious when you were giving your talk about is there any sort of like 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 large blood sample plates done to sort of keep tabs on the nutritional uh, welfare of astronauts as they spend long times in space? Or are we just doing this based entirely on what we see going into them? I don't really know. I think we're just freestyling it, which is a terrible way to do it. That's kind of what I was I was gathering as well, right? Because even even you know taking blood samples on Earth is a regular thing to sort of just see where we are nutrition wise. Yeah, but it's 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 so basic. The nutritional requirements are so wrong at such a basic level. I'm not even talking micronutrients. Forget vitamins and minerals. 0 0.8 grams per kilogram of protein is not enough for anyone. It's, we're not, we're not gonna go into that. I keep saying we're not gonna go into that and we're going into it, but- um, well, Harold just asked in the chat about red meat and uh, the, the need for larger spacecraft to try to fit some of these nutritional 
needs into the luggage area for for deep space missions? The meat in space is likely going to be um, like an insect based product. Like the most of the animal protein we will get in space is either going to be uh, like a lab grown cellular agriculture product on the American side or here on the Canadian side, the winning teams made insects. So you're telling us Snowpiercer is actually not fiction. It's it's future reality. Potentially. <laughs> Maybe eventually. But no, insects are actually really promising here on Earth as well. So that's why those teams were advantaged because the terrestrial potential is immense. The, the growing insects is really energy efficient, cost efficient, easy. They just, they're like weeds, but make them animals. And it's so easy to grow them. And they're incredibly nutritionally dense and it's fantastic. They have tons of vitamins and minerals, great amount of protein as well, super bioavailable. So they're a fantastic option. That's kind of where we're gearing ourselves. And crickets are like already consumed in some areas of the world. So it's, it's already there. Well, we, we're, we're, you're getting a lot of love in the chat. Um, people are, are excited about your passion for nutrition. Um, as a vegan, personally, I'm excited to uh, see some of this uh, mushroom bacon myself. Um, and as somebody who's had to get rid of cricket infestations in various places, I cannot imagine how awful that would be off planet. Uh, <laughs> no, we are not thinking about that. We are not putting that thought out into the world. Absolutely not. There will not be a cricket invasion on the spaceship to Mars. No. Who knows? I've watched a lot of movies, and this seems to be the point at which this all goes wrong. Um, well, uh, Kareem, there, there doesn't seem to be much more coming in in terms of questions, but I believe that there is a clubhouse hangout after this. Am I correct? Yeah, our RAC Montreal Center clubhouse, uh, the Zoom clubhouse is going to be open as of now, so people can join us there to continue the chat. Uh, Catherine, Virginia, I hope you'll consider joining for a little while. And uh, Orbax, you're always welcome if you'd like to join us. I know, I know you still got to get home because you're yeah. still... <laughs> I still have to get home. Hopefully my car has not been towed. <laughs> but if there's no further questions coming in, and I'll, I'll give it a, a few more minutes coming through. But, you know, here at, at the Guelph Physics live streams, we tend to close with a very specific question. And I'd like to ask uh, Virginia and Catherine um, their thoughts on these questions. And usually we ask our guests what their most exciting days as a scientist have been. Um, if they can track down one single incredible incident or what one day was that really changed your direction or blew your mind as a young person working in science. Uh, and since we haven't really got to hear much from Virginia lately, uh, I'll throw this to you first, Virginia. Sure. Thank you. Um, well, I've been, I've recently started doing research, um, I, under a professor at the department at Bishops and, um, very briefly, my research is. Uh, looking into supermassive black holes at the center of quasars. So these are active black holes that are accreting. And um, up until I started doing research, I've never really seen um, like real uh, astronomical data. And so I started working with uh, data from the Chandra X-ray telescope and the Hubble Space Telescope. And I think the most exciting moment for me was when uh, I finally, uh, you know, got through the hurdles of my code being incorrect and pulling my hair um, and finally got an image, um, I was super excited to see one tiny little dot in the center <laughs> of the picture. And I was just so amazed that that one little dot that had a total of three photons detected on that pixel was a supermassive black hole accreting matter built, uh, like so far away in space. So that was definitely <laughs> the most exciting moment. For That's me. amazing. Isn't, isn't that incredible? You know, it's, <laughs> it seems like such a nerdy thing to just be like, yeah. that, that, one, that one pixel, that one pixel right there has got a little bit of information on it. But it can be, it can, after you've dedicated so much time to something, even the smallest little bit of information like that could just be, change your whole day, change your whole career. Yeah. Catherine, same to you. Um, mine is very different. So last summer I had the chance to participate in the junior astronauts virtual day camp. So the other nutrition person at the CSA, uh, her name is Hope. We went to school together for solid two years. Um, she realized that I spoke French. It's a thing. And asked me if I wanted to participate um, in the food production activities for the day camp. And I was really excited about it. It was all virtual. It ran over two weeks. We did a dry run and the real thing uh, so the dry run was with CSA um, 
employees children's children so it was um i don't know the age group was a little off but it worked out really well regardless and uh, then we did it with the actual children who were involved in the day camp and for me the biggest moment of whoa was um when i was actively moderating one of the food production activities which was asking the, the, the children to design a greenhouse on the moon just as a theoretical exercise hypothetical and they had to draw it using a platform and there were astronauts popping in and out of the different breakout rooms we were in and in that moment in time i had actual canadian astronauts as co-workers and it was the strangest <laughs> yes most amazing feeling where joshua kutrick just streamed in and so did jenny and they were we had a discussion and moderated and it was insane so yeah. that's awesome. that's amazing that's awesome. incredible <laughs> well thank you so much for your presentations this evening we appreciate it um i'm gonna we're gonna remove you from the screen right now but don't run away we'll say goodbye to you off the air um i wanted to thank uh kareem as well for uh joining us with the rasc uh do you have anything coming up that uh any of our followers could join up with or could follow Absolutely. Uh, in February on the 19th at 7 p.m., we have our February public event for celebrating Perseverance first year on Mars. Uh, Erin Gibbons is going to be talking to us about the actual scientific mission. She's been helping to plan where Percy goes and working a little bit on the actual chemistry of the rocks on Mars. And so we'll be advertising that and that will be available as a Zoom webinar so people can register in advance. It's uh, bit.ly slash Percy1YR first year. Um, and again, we are welcoming anybody who wants to join us at one of our clubhouses, pop in as a guest, get to know the RAC Montreal Center rascals. And uh, <laughs> I guarantee you, you'll have a good evening. We, we love chatting and uh, we love chatting all things space, all things astronomy, astrophotography, space sciences, rocketry, you name it. We're, we're just a fun group to just chat with. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I appreciate your help. And uh, oh, and I'll be emailing you soon about our upcoming uh, stargazing guide for February. So sounds great. We'll or Maxim, thanks for hosting. No problem. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for joining us here tonight. Uh, make sure to get a, if you get a chance, if you're joining us from the Guelph physics side of things, to go over and follow the RASC at Montreal Center. And if you're joining us from the Montreal Center, Thank you so much for following us tonight. And if you're interested, you can follow the Guelph Physics on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, where we do monthly streams. Uh, we'll see you back in February, where I believe we'll be talking to the people at the Canadian Light Source. Exciting stuff. So until then, enjoy and have a science-tastic day.